Hey, thanks for checking out this sermon. It's designed to help you take your next step with Jesus. And if you need additional help on how to do that, we have a Next Steps page on our website that you can check out. Also, if you haven't been able to attend a service at any one of our campuses recently and participate in the time of giving, you can give anytime you want online by visiting our Give page or by texting to give. We hope that God speaks to you in this sermon. Take care. I've got some, some good news and I've got some bad news. Which, which one do you want first? Why, do, why does everyone always go bad first? That doesn't make any sense to me. Last night, everyone said bad. I actually don't have good or bad news. I just have always wanted to ask that question. Uh, I guess I only have good news at points and, and bad news at certain points, and I think that's true of most of us. At certain moments in our lives, we've received some form of news, whether it be good news or bad news, and we've felt a responsibility or a desire to share that news. Like 10 years ago, when my parents called me, who are pastors down in, in San Diego, and uh, I don't want to get that. Uh, <laughs> they, they're, they're, they're pastors down in San Diego, and they, they heard about my friend Austin, who had tragically passed away during an accident at a construction site. And he was young at the time, and, and this is a guy I had grown up with. And so my parents called me and they told me and they said, you, you now have a responsibility, Steve. And I said, what's that? And they said, Donnie doesn't know yet. And Donnie grew up with Austin. Donnie and Austin were best friends. And Donnie was also one of my closest friends. And so I had to call Donnie and share the news with him. And I, it was something I hated doing. And I, and I learned that day that death is always bad news for everyone involved. But on the other hand... Life is always good news for everyone involved. About five years ago, two of my best friends who had been trying for what seemed like an eternity to get pregnant finally conceived. And this is a couple that my wife and I had been praying for tirelessly. And so it just happened that they saw me first after they had heard the news of their pregnancy and they said, Steve, we're going to be parents and we celebrated together and it was awesome. And they said, we just have one rule. Please don't tell Amanda, we want to do that. I said, totally. I will definitely not tell Amanda. But like I said, life is always good news. So before I knew it, I walked outside and I called Amanda and said, they're pregnant. It's awesome, and we celebrated together, and I said, but don't judge me. Like I told Amanda, don't let them know that you know. <laughs> Make sure you act surprised. And they, she did a great job. They had no clue until right now <laughs> that I had told Amanda. But, but I think this is true for all of us. At some point in our lives, we've had news to share. Something significant happened, something, something important and valuable and something that mattered. We, we either heard or learned about this news and we felt either a responsibility or a desire to share, to go tell it. You know, for those of us who follow Jesus, we've, we've experienced this throughout our lives as followers of Christ. This responsibility and this desire to share the good news of Jesus and what he has done in our lives and how he has transformed and changed us from the inside out. And the awesome thing is that when, when we do share, 
when we do go tell it, we are aligning very closely with the person and character of Jesus because Jesus was in the news sharing business. I, I don't know if you knew this, but, but news isn't just something that we came up with recently that, that this, it's this new modern deal that we watch on television. News has actually been around for a while. Um, in Matthew 4, here's, here's what we read. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria. And it's important for us to understand what Jesus is doing here. He's teaching, he's giving advice on how one should live their lives, how one should live their life, and he's preaching. Now, when we hear the word preaching, you might associate that with what I'm doing right now, what you're listening to. Or if you're newer to church, if you're visiting us today, you might associate preaching with coming to church and being told what to do and what not to do. And you may not be wrong there. But in the first century, the word preach wasn't a religious word. It was actually a news word. See, Jesus was sharing with the world that something significant had happened. He was telling the news, and the news that Jesus was, was broadcasting to humanity wasn't just any news. It was really good news. And that's what the word gospel means, a word that a lot of us have heard before and have some understanding of, but I think it's important for us to be aware that this isn't just something that Christ followers came up with after Jesus left the earth. Gospel is something that Jesus himself proclaimed, something that Jesus preached. In Mark chapter one, here's what Jesus says. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. These are words from Jesus himself. You see, Jesus' gospel is that the kingdom of God is available to everyone through him. That when he came to earth, when, the when, 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 when God became flesh, when the word became flesh and dwelt among us, Salvation, healing, hope became available to every person everywhere. This is good news. And for those of us who consider ourselves disciples of Jesus, this is fascinating to me. We actually get invited to be an agent of his kingdom to experience a life with God and then to become an expression of, of his provision and generosity and compassion and love and joy to the broken around us. This is something Jesus commissioned us to do. It's like when he healed a man in Luke chapter eight and he said, return home and tell how much God has done for you. Or, or when Jesus sent out his 12 disciples with power and authority to drive out demons and, and, and heal diseases, he said, preach the kingdom of God. Go tell the good news. Or after Jesus rose from the dead, he told those same disciples to preach the gospel to all creation. And then for 40 days after that, as he was talking about the kingdom of God, he told those listening, you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Go preach, go tell it, you will be my witness. You see, Jesus himself had a gospel to proclaim. He had the news of the availability of the kingdom of God through him, that God is present here and now. Here's the, the fascinating thing about, about Jesus, is that Jesus didn't come to try and explain God. He was the explanation of God. This was good news, that God became man. The word became flesh. God was here. God is with us. See, this is big news from a big God. And, and if God wanted to, if God wanted to, if he really wanted to, God could have placed one foot firmly in the Pacific Ocean and one foot firmly in the Atlantic Ocean and declared to humanity, hey, I'm here for you. But instead, he chooses us to share his news. He implores and commissions, like we just saw through those texts, through Jesus' ministry. He sends his followers to communicate. He says very clearly to us, go tell it. And over the next few weeks, leading up to Christmas on all of our campuses and for those joining us online and through the incarcerated church, we're going to unpack the value and importance of this phrase, not just for what it means for us now, 
but for what it meant for everyone who originally heard the news of Jesus' coming to earth. We're gonna look at the value and importance of understanding who was told, how they were told, why they were told, and then how we are to respond 2,000 years later to this news, to this declaration of Christ come to earth. So we're getting a little bit of a head start on Christmas, not as much as Costco. They beat us to the punch a little bit. But we are getting a head start. So we're gonna begin today about 700 years before Jesus was born with, with the first group of people who were told about Jesus coming to earth. And I wanna set the scene a little bit for what's going on at this point in history. You see, God's people are in a dark place 700 years before Jesus was born. Idolatry and corruption and, and division are the prevailing themes of their lives. There's actually so much division in, in the kingdom, in God's people, that it's been separated into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. There's the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. This is how much division has taken place amongst God's people, that they've been split into two groups of people. Go ahead and turn to Isaiah chapter seven. This is where we're gonna begin our study today in Isaiah seven. We're gonna spend a little bit of time walking through this, this prophecy from the prophet Isaiah. And the prophet Isaiah is someone who spoke on behalf of God to Israel's leaders, which is what a prophet does. And Isaiah warned Israel's leaders, God's people, about the coming judgment God says he's going to judge them by sending Assyria and Babylon after them if they persist in their idolatry and their oppression of, their, of the poor. Isaiah says that this impending devastation is going to be like a purifying fire that burns away everything that is worthless in Israel in order to make way for a new Jerusalem that is filled with people who have repented and turned back to God. This is what we learn in the first few chapters of Isaiah. And then when we, when we get to Isaiah 6, it's really interesting what's going on here. Isaiah gets this grand vision from God, a vision of God sitting on his throne. And Isaiah, in this moment, realizes how corrupt he and his people are. And he's, he's terrified that he's going to be destroyed by the holiness of God. But in this vision, he's not. Instead, he's purified from his sin. And he thinks about the, as, as he thinks about the magnitude of all this, God commissions him with a task. God says to Isaiah, hey, Isaiah, go share the news. And just a heads up, what you will be sharing is going to harden the hearts of my people. It will be news that shares, uh, that speaks of their destruction. But it's not without hope. You see, what Isaiah shares and what will inevitably come will serve as a refining process for God's people. And after all of this, God will send a new king, a king whose, whose kingdom will set the people free from violence and oppression. The prophet Isaiah's broadcast of this moment of the, of the coming of this king is where we're gonna pick up in chapter seven. We're gonna start right in verse 14. Let's, let's read starting there. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. For any of us who have been around church for a while, we know that this word Emmanuel means God with us. This name Emmanuel screams God is present with us. Which must have been so hopeful for them. Like how cool is that? They're sitting in the midst of, of despair and they hear, hey, God's coming to be with us. But hold on, because as, as Isaiah keeps going, here's, here's what we read. He will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. The Lord will bring on you and on your people and on the house of your father a time unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. Here's what Isaiah is telling his people. Hey, pay attention. God is coming to be with us. But before he does, things aren't gonna be all that great. The land will be laid to waste. 
it will be like nothing you've ever seen. He goes on to use imagery throughout the rest of this chapter, like the Lord will whistle for flies from the Nile Delta in Egypt and for bees from the land of Assyria. He says the land will be riddled with, with briars and thorns. Judgment is coming your way. Your evil ways, your oppression of the poor, your mistreatment of the widows, the violence you inflict on the innocent has all caught up with you. Things aren't gonna be good, but there's hope for those who are suffering. Flip over to chapter nine and let's read of this glimmer of hope that these people who are caught in despair would have grabbed onto. And I'm gonna read about seven verses here, and if that's a while for, for, for you, just sit back and, and listen and see if you can kind of feel what this may have felt like for, these, for Isaiah's audience. Or you can follow along with me if you learn better that way. But let's start right in verse one. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he, he humbled the land of Zebulun, and the land of Nephtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of, of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire, for to us a child is born. To us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders." And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Do you hear the hope? This is what's to come. This is for us, God with us, Emmanuel. You know, every time I read this prophecy and I read, you know, Isaiah chapter seven and then get to Isaiah chapter nine and, and, and really as you keep reading these first 12 or so chapters of Isaiah, I can't help but think of one specific Christmas carol, especially this time of year. Now, during, during Christmas, we sing a lot of the same songs and they give us a lot of joy and we celebrate and it's awesome and it's fun and, 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 and we, we, we really remember these songs. Like, they stick with us a lot. When I was younger, my mom attempted to teach me the piano. It ended miserably for her. It was a bad choice on her part. But there's still one song that I still remember. Literally, out of all the songs I learned, there is one song I still remember. And I wanna see if you guys, if you guys can pick up on the song that my mom taught me when, when I was younger. Uh, except I don't know how to work this thing. Hey, John, are you back there? Anyone? Hey, buddy, how do you... My man, what are you doing? <laughs> how, do you, um, how, do you, how do you start one of these? Like, I, just, I had one of the ones that was just, you just hit a button and it made noise. All right, first things first... And this is a lesson to you all. I mean, have you tried turning it on? I didn't, I didn't go there yet, no. Okay, all right, I, I got you. Right there? Okay. All right, go ahead. Oh, the lights. Go ahead. Okay. What are you going to do? Are you, uh, just hold on. Should I stop there? Or? I think, <laughs> okay. that's kind of my thing. Like the music is my thing. The preaching, that's more like what you do. <laughs> but what were your thoughts? Like this, it means a lot to my mom taught me this one. Like this was 25 uh, years ago. So don't, I don't know. say hey, anything too. To be fair, I would say that you did actually a really good job. Really? Yeah, legitimately. I think that was a really good job, to be fair. Like, yeah. like th thank you. Like good enough to, like you got a spot for me? Like went, like. During the weekend when people are here or like during the week? Yeah, no, like on the worship team or maybe your own personal band, whatever. Uh, shoot, my phone is blowing up. 
Hold on. You brought your phone out with you. Yeah, hold on. Trisha just texted. All the worship leaders just texted. They said there's literally no spots available. <laughs> just now. Everyone texted you right now? In just this now. So. Cool, man. I mean, that's still available. Okay. Like, you want to go there? Yeah, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll go yeah, do that. I'll go with well. you. All right. Um, well, guys, can you all give it up for John Orozco, our worship leader? You know, John, there's, there's these songs, and I know, like, I, I wanted to get your perspective on some of this. There's, there's these songs that we sing during this time of year that are so joyous. Like Joy to the World that you were playing just Joy now. Joy to the World, yeah. like the song Joy is in the title. Yeah. And, like, they stick with us. Like, we, mm-hmm. we, we remember these things, um, and, and we celebrate, and it's, like, there's this anticipation of Jesus are there songs that you celebrate with during this time of year, like what some of your favorites or, or something like that? Yeah, this year has such a cool vibe. It's got this buzz to it. And even on, on Wednesday, so this is the day before Thanksgiving, early in the morning, my wife is pumped on Christmas already. So we haven't had turkey yet. We haven't had anything, no gravy, which technically is a food group. You can have just gravy alone. It's amazing. But we haven't had Wait, any of those things. I feel like we should stop there. You think you can have gravy by itself? Absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, sometimes... How do you look the way you do? You go to your mother-in-law's house, and that's kind of all you can stomach. Um, no, nah, no. Nah. You know your mother's cooking is amazing. Where is His she? His wife's sitting right Where over there. Rebecca, no. you cool with that? I don't see her, but hey. Uh, if you're watching, your mother's cooking is amazing. I love it. But yeah, we haven't even had Thanksgiving yet with the family, and... We're pulling out all the bins with our Christmas stuff. Yeah. And that morning, like, the tree's going up, all the decorations are going up, and she's got the music blasting, and we're listening to Hark the Herald, mm. Joy of the World, Go Tell It. Yeah. And there's just this energy about Christmas and the songs. They are so bright. Yeah. Don't you feel that? Yeah, yeah, totally. And I think that's why. So this, this song that, that, we're, that, we're, that I'm referencing through this prophecy, uh-huh. It always feels so weird to me. Yeah. Do any of you guys feel that way? When you hear O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, it's, it's a beautiful song, don't yeah. get me wrong, but it's like, why are we so sad that yeah. Jesus came to earth? Yeah. Like, what's, what's the, and there's this, like, tension that I feel, and, mm-hmm. and the tone is so somber. Yeah. So, I, like, what's that like as a musician, or, like, we sing all these joyous celebratory songs, yeah. but then there's this one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of these songs, when they're constructed, the melodies, they do a thing where it feels really bright and it has this veneer of, like, hope and joy. But if you really dig deep into the lyrics, there's some context there that needs to be unpacked. And O Come, O Come, Emmanuel is one of those songs. And to me, it's really beautiful because it's, it's complete mm-hmm. in what it's trying to convey. You get to that chorus, rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, and there's just this lifting that happens in your soul because of who has come, but they're in captivity. Like, this song is written under the context of a people who aren't free, who are bound to something that is holding them back, but still they're being encouraged to rejoice. And so you have these seemingly opposing things, but that's why Jesus is so essential in this season, because, yeah, all of us as human beings, we have conflict but we're called to lift our heads up and rejoice because of who Jesus is, what he's come to do. And so that song does that in such a beautiful way. It's, it's a fascinating song, too. I, I read that uh, the guy who, who wrote, well, not the guy who wrote it, the guy who, like, dusted yeah. and found it and yeah. dusted it off. It, it was an Anglican priest, and he was too, a little too progressive mm-hmm. and too much of a rock star with his cutting-edge songs, like, yeah. Oh, Come, Oh, Come, Emmanuel. Dangerous song, Oh, Come, and Oh, Come, yeah. So they sent him to Africa, uh-huh. and when he was in Africa, he, he opened... Um, an orphanage and a home for girls and a home for, for prostitutes, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and I just think of like, these are the lowest in society and mm-hmm. this is one of the songs that he's singing mm-hmm. to them. He felt that moment. song was so appropriate for that context. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like you said, he went to Africa and it was this broken situation, depravity, injustice, and these girls were in this situation, many of them in that situation completely unwillingly and he was able to pull them out, praise God, but... For him to dust off that hymn, find this song, and I can only imagine him singing it to these girls knowing their story and still encouraging them to rejoice and letting them know that that word rejoice belonged to them because of what Jesus came to do. And that song is so beautiful because of that. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I think that's why I've, I've always felt like this song was, was a little misplaced because mm-hmm. unless you understand the intended audience, mm-hmm. which is the... Isaiah's intended audience, mm-hmm. like, despair is real. Yeah. Like, these people are caught in the greatest paradox in human history. Yeah. Extreme despair, but hey, Jesus is coming in 700 Absolutely. years. So good. Like, 
Yeah. Jeez. So good. Crazy. Well, I'm going to leave you to your preaching. Yeah, thanks, I'll man. do my singing. You stay okay. doing that. Okay. All right, cool. cool. Thanks, brother. Uh, yeah, thanks, John. <laughs> See, I, I love getting John's perspective on, on just these songs we sing and, and maybe try and bring a little bit more life to this as we, as we sing songs like this during the Christmas season. And while this song was written centuries later um, from, from what we've, we've read here, I think it does an incredible job of describing and capturing the brokenness of people crying out for their long-awaited Savior. And the interesting thing is that I think this paradox that I talked about being at play I think it's still at play today. Like, yeah, we know, we know that Jesus came, but I still think there are moments when, when we're, we're caught and we feel the weight of our own sin where we're crying out, oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Or there's moments when we look at the brokenness and the pain and the hurt in those around us and we scream out to God, I need you, come here, oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Or moments where, where we look and we see, we see division and disunity and, 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 and oppression and injustice and persecution and we scream out, God, where are you in this? O come, O come, Emmanuel. And I think taking a moment to just let this, the tone of this song sit in during this season, this, 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 this phrase that's not so much a phrase but a plea from the depths of our being God, come, be with us. Let's see if this resonates.
See, when, when we take a moment to understand or listen to that song, I feel like it, it helps me grasp the feeling and the, and the, the tone for, for Isaiah's audience. But it's still so weird to me that part of that song says rejoice, rejoice. Like why rejoice? I mean, this was written after Jesus was born, but it's written in the context of he hasn't come yet. So why would we rejoice? Well, I think this is pretty simple because for us, we know that no matter what situation we face and no matter what moment we've had where we've cried out, oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, God, I need you in this moment, we know that God's already here. He's with us. We aren't waiting anymore. The audience Isaiah was writing to was waiting and waiting. They waited for hundreds and hundreds of years, but Jesus came. Emmanuel, God with us, is real. Now, do things sometimes seem bleak in the world around us? Do we see violence and oppression and injustice in our news feeds? Do we see disunity and division on our social media timelines? Do we feel the heaviness of guilt from our sin? Yes, but... Emmanuel, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus was born, Jesus lived, Jesus suffered. The whip of the Roman soldiers drew real blood. The thorns pierced real flesh. The nails caused excruciating pain that was valid. And the cross led to an actual death. But that wasn't the end of the story because Jesus rose from the dead. And when he did, he conquered all of that other stuff. We find hope in this season and throughout our lives because of Jesus' ultimate victory over sin and death. And I know for any of us who have given our lives to Jesus, this is incredible news for so many of us that God with us has radically and completely and entirely shifted the course of not only our life now, but the course of eternity for us. Like how cool is it that we got invited into that? That we experienced his hope and that we get to experience his hope day in and day out. But that's not the end of our story either. See, this is the important part that we have to remember. Jesus was in the news announcing business. He was the explanation of God. And when he ascended to heaven, he didn't leave us. He didn't say, all right, you're on your own, figure it out. No, he gave us the Holy Spirit and the mission to extend his kingdom, to be carriers and sharers of the good news that God is with us to go tell it. I mean, think about how big this is, that God would call us, even me, with all my deficiencies and all my brokenness and all my sin, and he says, I could tell the whole world about me, but I'm gonna use you instead. I'm gonna use the broken, torn down version of you to speak of my grace and mercy and love and compassion. God, you are crazy, that you would use me. I mean, you're awesome, but that's crazy. That you want us, that you want me to proclaim Emmanuel, that we're, the, that we're your best bet. You know, in Isaiah's day, and for most of, of history, the gods of other religions didn't care very much about other people, which consequently meant that the followers of these gods didn't have to care about people either. But the God of Israel was different. He cared about all people, even the people who weren't his people. His plan for restoration included everyone. And this is what's so interesting and fascinating and captivating about God is that everyone matters to God whether or not he matters to them. Isn't that insane? Everyone matters to God whether or not they care about him at all. And and, and so then because this is true, as his people, as those who who do rejoice because we do know that God is with us. We have a responsibility then to care for all people as well. We have a responsibility to share the good news with everyone. And just like Isaiah, we have a lot to to share. I mean, it may be a different time. It may be a different place than, than when Isaiah shared and where Isaiah shared, but God with us is just as hopeful and just as significant in the East Bay of California in 2018 as it was then. The news of Jesus' presence is always good news. But here's the deal. We can talk about Jesus and tell people about Jesus all we want. And that's actually really important for us to do. It's part of our responsibility. But here's what I've noticed as I've gone throughout my life. If you wanna know what someone means by what they say, watch what they do. 
If you wanna know what someone means by what they say, watch what they do. I have a quote hanging in my office that says this. You can't preach good news and be bad news. I don't know who said this, but gosh dang, they were dead on. We have a responsibility to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Therefore, we have a responsibility to be good news in the world around us. See, the thing about Jesus that completely shifted and, and, and changed the course of the world was his radical love. That was his good news. That's what came through him, a love that has, has never been seen or experienced in the history of humanity. And that's what Jesus is inviting each of us into and imploring each of us to broadcast with our lives, to share the good news of his Emmanuelness, to tell of Jesus' presence with each of us through what we do, how we live, how we act, and how we love. You see, the church's role is and always has been through our personal and corporate behavior to show everyone that we are all precious in his sight, that everyone matters to God. So how do we make sure we're doing this? Where do we start? Well, I think it would be wise for us to take a look at a group of people that Isaiah was sure to include. As he wrote in chapter 10, the first two verses, woe to those who make unjust laws, to those who issue oppressive decrees, to deprive the poor of their rights and withhold justice from the oppressed of my people, making widows their prey and robbing the fatherless. You see, Emmanuel was good news for everyone, but it was most definitely good news for certain groups of people that Isaiah was sure to include. Emmanuel was hope for the poor, was hope for the oppressed, was hope for the widows, for the fatherless, for the persecuted, for the broken, for the hurting. If you're wondering where to start, where you can start being good news in a world that desperately needs to see good news, start there. I mean, there's a reason why as a church, we've chosen these first 12 days of December to serve the community and the world around us. And these are the groups of people we've specifically chosen to serve. It's why there are opportunities to care for kids without warm beds, why there's opportunities to pack meals for people without food, or, or, or opportunities to send much needed, to, to, uh, much needed supplies to our persecuted brothers and sisters throughout the world. Look, if you aren't aware of, of who needs to see good news in your life right now, or you haven't had a chance to engage in our 12 days of serving, go to our Next Steps area or to where our outreach team is and say, hey, I wanna be good news. Or if you're watching online, just go online and click on 12 Days of Serving and find a place to engage, find a place to get involved. I mean, if there's any time where the church can show the world what we believe by what we do, I mean, we should be doing this all year round, but gosh, December, when the whole world is looking at Jesus is a phenomenal time to show people who we are by what we believe. And if you, if you ever feel overwhelmed, like every time I go to a church and the guy, the guy on stage or the, or the woman on stage says like, hey, here's what you should do. If you ever feel overwhelmed, because I just said like we have a responsibility to care for all people, every person we have a responsibility to care for. If that's overwhelming for you, just do this. Yes, we have a responsibility to care for everyone. Is that possible? No. So just do for one person what you wish you could do for every person. Do for one person what you wish you could do for every person. Maybe that one person is, is a, a senior who needs a letter of encouragement. Maybe that one person is a kid who, who needs, needs to get a, a bike bill, which is a, an opportunity we have. Maybe that one person is someone in the persecuted church who just needs medical supplies, and all you have to do is go online and spend $35 to send medical supplies through Voice of the Martyrs to someone who's being persecuted somewhere else in the world. I mean, that's being good news. But we also know that this isn't what we're limited to. Like, we're all well aware, well aware of people in our lives who need to see the good news of Jesus right now. Someone we can serve, someone we interact with. Maybe it's a colleague at work who asks for our help. Maybe it's a neighbor who can't hang their Christmas lights by themselves. Maybe it's, it's waking up in the middle of the night to get the kids and not pretending like you're asleep, which is something I never did. There are so many opportunities right in front of us to be good news, to go tell it through the way we love, live, and serve, to show the world that God is with us and that means something to us. To close, I just wanna caution all of us on something um, as you're listening to me talk because generally it's easier to hear about serving than it is to actually serve. At my last church, there was a woman who uh, was headed into an operation and she asked her husband if he could watch the kids for a couple days while she recovered. And uh, which, by the way, if you're a dad and your wife asks you to watch the kids, that's just being a dad. 
It's not like you don't get paid for babysitting or anything like that. So just say yes. But, but the, uh, the, the husband said no. He said he couldn't do it. And the reason why, I'm not making this up, the reason why he could not watch the kids while his wife went through an operation was because he was attending a Christian conference for husbands and fathers to teach them how to be better husbands and fathers. <laughs> That's a true story. Like, that happens. So yes, sometimes it's easier to hear about serving than it is to actually serve. You know, anyone who follows Jesus that's listening to me talk knows that Jesus has commissioned each of us to go tell it. And we can talk about how much we love Jesus and we can say how much Jesus means to us, but if you wanna know what someone means by what they say, watch what they do. This Christmas season, let's not just be hearers, let's not just talk about how amazing Jesus is to us. Let's preach with our hands. Let's minister with our feet. Let our, let's allow our actions to be a sermon that declares the presence of our Savior in our lives. Let's be good news in a world that is crying out, pleading for something to conquer their despair. A world that may not even know it, but they, they are crying out, oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Let's be good news. And what a privilege and honor it is that we get to convey the gospel of Jesus Christ to our friends and our neighbors and our family and anyone we come in contact with to show humanity God is with us and it's available to everyone. I'll leave us today with a few more words from the prophet Isaiah in chapter 12, verses four through five. Here's what Isaiah says. Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Or in other words, go tell it. Let's sing.